Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and for those of you joining from the West Coast, good morning. Um, thank you all for being a part of today's web forum. My name is Cynthia Benz, and I'm going to serve as a moderator for today's discussion. Um, we expect the program to last approximately an hour, um, and we hope there's going to be a, about 20 minutes at the end of the program for active participation. So we, we really hope that um, you all are able to, um, to provide your feedback to us. Um, in addition to those that you'll see listed as on the agenda on the next slide as guest speakers, um, we just wanted to give you a sense of the individuals um, who are planning to join the webinar today. Um, we have 75 uh, registrants, and of that, uh, the majority had identified as other patients or patient advocates. Uh, we also have a number of healthcare provider representatives and researchers on the line. So um, we're really thrilled to have um, what we think will be a dynamic and uh, especially a diverse um, group of participants. So this is the planned agenda for the web forum. Um, we're going to start off by running through some housekeeping items because, we, like I said, we have um, an interactive portion that uh, will require some, some instruction. Um, then we're going to give a bit of background on the project and what uh, we hope we're going to be able to accomplish over the next couple of years. Uh, following, following the introduction uh, to the webinar and the project, we're going to introduce our guest speakers who are already on the line. Uh, and they're going to share a bit about the work um, that, that they're doing at their organization and how personalized medicine has really been able to transform uh, disease treatment for, um, for lung cancer. They're going to go through a bit um, about some of the challenges that they've identified and making sure patients have access. Um, to those personalized treatments and um, also help us think through some of the, the knowledge gaps that are still existing that um, we could hopefully address with this project. And then the remaining time at the end is going to be devoted to receiving your feedback. Um, and the feedback that we get is directly going to inform the principles that we're hoping to establish that will help us better align uh, the priority patient outcomes uh, with personalized medicine treatment strategies and outcomes research. So uh, we thought it would be helpful to get you all acquainted with the webinar function. Uh, right now your audio is muted. You, um, you're going to need to uh, raise your hand to be unmuted. Um, and here you can see just a screen capture of what it takes to, um, to raise your hand and be unmuted. Uh, the participant bar um, is at the bottom of your screen, and then the raise hand button will be uh, to your upper uh, right hand side of your computer screen. And then once uh, we see that, David will be able, able to unmute your line. Um, and if you have any challenges at any point, just feel free to, um, to contact us through the Q&A function or, or email us. Um, let's see here. Um, we did uh, disable your video webcam, so if any of you are sitting there in your Halloween costumes or you have pets or children or anybody else who likes to make an appearance when you're on FaceTime, um, that you don't have to worry about that. Um, we do have the Q&A and polling features enabled, um, and these are going to be located on your sidebar uh, toward the bottom of the screen, um, and we will uh, load questions during the discussion period uh, for you to respond to, and we'll be able to receive those, see those responses. We'll plan to pause um, after, after we get your responses just to see if there's anything that anyone uh, would like to add or um, if there's any comments you'd like to make. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Um, we're going to archive it uh, for future viewing and also disseminate it. Um, and like I said, if you have any technical problems, um, you can feel free to use the Q&A feature um, on, on the webinar, or you can just email uh, ddavenport at personalizedmedicinecoalition.org, and we will be responsive to you. Um, so, um, because this is the first interaction many of you have had with us, we thought uh, it would be helpful for you to know a little bit more about the Personalized Medicine Coalition. Um, the coalition has been around for about 14 years. We have 230 members. large number of the members are patients, providers, drug and diagnostic companies, health systems, uh, academics, and uh, we even have a few members who are insurers. The coalition came together to promote the understanding and adoption of personalized medicine concepts, services, and products um, because we believe that they have a benefit for patients as well as for the healthcare system. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Cynthia Benz, and I'm joined by my colleague David Davenport. Uh, David and I lead the public policy efforts here at PNC. Uh, we're just a small part of the team. Uh, what falls into our bucket here um, in public policy um, spans everything from um, supporting federal funding for basic research that feeds into personalized medicine, uh, the FDA's process for regulating uh, personalized medicine, drugs, diagnostics, and uh, other types of products, 
And then we, um, we also get engaged in issues related to coverage and payment um, at the federal level. Um, so as the government's thinking through how they can cover and pay for uh, personalized medicine products and care delivery, we like to try to make sure that, um, that everyone's voices are at the table. And so we're um, spearheading the project um, that Hokori has funded together uh, because we really believe it has the potential to inform our work and our members' work at every level. So some of you indicated during registration that you're familiar with personalized medicine, uh, but we actually get this question a lot, so we thought it was important to set the stage. Uh, personalized medicine is often referred to as precision medicine. It's an evolving field with physicians use molecular diagnostic tests to determine which medical treatments will work best for their patients. Uh, by combining that information uh, from those tests with an individual's medical history, circumstances, and values, healthcare providers and patients can develop targeted treatment and prevention plans. So in general, some of the benefits of first-line medicine um, are that it can shift the emphasis in medicine from reaction to prevention. It can direct uh, targeted therapy and reduce trial and error prescribing. It can reduce adverse drug uh, reactions by identifying patients who are more likely to respond to them, um, as well as help to determine the optimal dose. In some cases, it can increase patient adherence to treatment. It can reduce high-risk invasive testing procedures. And in other cases, it can um, really help control overall healthcare costs by reducing unnecessary care. So this is what the Personalized Medicine Coalition is trying to advance and what we hope personalized medicine will ideally deliver. Uh, but in reality, what we've observed is there's a lot of knowledge that still needs to be gained to deliver these benefits consistently. And many of the knowledge gaps relate to a lack of understanding around a person's history, circumstances, and values, and how that can effectively guide treatment decision making. So this is where patient-centered outcomes research can help. Uh, some of you also uh, let us know that you're familiar with patient-centered outcomes research, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, we thought we would run through what PCORI's definition is. Um, patient-centered outcomes research is research that helps people and their caregivers communicate and make informed healthcare decisions. It allows their voices to be heard in assessing the value of healthcare options. And this research answers patient-centered questions such as, um, given my personal characteristics, conditions, and preferences, what should I expect will happen to me? What are my options, and what are the potential benefits and harms of those options? What can I do to improve the outcomes that are most important to me? How can clinicians and the care delivery system they work in help me make the best decisions about my health and my health care? And then to answer these questions, patient-centered outcomes research assesses the benefits and harms of preventive, diagnostic, therapeutic, palliative, or other interventions to inform decision-making, highlighting comparisons and outcomes that matter to people. It's inclusive of an individual's preference, autonomy, and needs, focusing on outcomes that people notice and care about, such as survival, function, symptoms, and health-related quality of life. Patient-centered outcomes research incorporates a wide variety of settings and diverse participants to address individual differences and barriers to implementation and dissemination, and it may investigate optimizing outcomes while addressing burdens to individuals, availability of services, technology, personnel, and other stakeholder perspectives. So as you can start to see, personalized medicine and patient-centered outcomes research are pointed in the same direction. And at this phase, we just need some guidance on where to focus the field. So the title of the project is descriptive of what we hope to achieve. Um, as an overview, the project includes three types of activities. The first is that we'll work with you to develop a set of patient-centered principles to advance personalized medicine. This process will take the form of four web forums over the next year. The web forums are able to accommodate up to 100 participants, and we're at 75 now, so we still have some room to grow. Um, we'll invite approximately 45 individual patients, caregivers, researchers, healthcare providers, and other stakeholders to an in-person roundtable in Washington, D.C. And then at that roundtable, participants, participants will translate the principles that you helped us develop into a patient-centered outcomes research agenda. We're going to publish the complete research agenda as a white paper by the summer of 2020. And then the research agenda will be made publicly available to inform future patient-centered outcomes research studies that will help provide patients, caregivers, clinicians, and others with the evidence they need to make more informed healthcare decisions related to personalized medicine. So the project was selected by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute to receive a Eugene Washington Engagement Award because it will establish partnerships and build a community that's equipped to participate in research and also help to advance patient-centered uh, clinical effectiveness research. 
The Eugene Washington Engagement Award funding mechanism is specifically geared toward projects that um, encourage active integration of patients, caregiver, clinician, and other stakeholders um, as integral members of the research enterprise. And so we're really thankful to PCORI for their support of the project and also the encouragement they gave PMC over the last two years um, that was able to make this project possible. So now it's a pleasure of introducing our guest speakers for the first web forum. They're David LaDuc and Danielle Hicks from the um, Adario Lung Cancer Foundation. Uh, David's executive director. He joined the foundation in August of 2015 as senior director of strategic alliances. As executive director, he's responsible for overseeing all aspects of ALCS efforts with a particular focus on strategic planning, operational excellence, fundraising, community outreach, staff development, and allocation of resources. David has nearly 25 years of senior executive experience and has a proven track record in strategic planning, innovative marketing, fundraising, public awareness for cancer and other causes. Prior to ALCF, he was Senior Director of Development at Free to Breathe and former Executive Director of the Wisconsin Foundation. Beyond his professional experience, David's got a strong personal passion for the mission of ALCF, having lost his father, two grandparents, and numerous friends to cancer. He's seen firsthand how patient education, access to care, and research advancements can positively impact lives, and it's the passion that um, he has that drives his work today. Danielle Hicks is Associate Executive Director of Patient Services and Programs at ALCF. Danielle began her journey with lung cancer in 2003 when her mother, Bonnie J. Adario, was first diagnosed, but she continues her 24-7 involvement with fighting the disease because of the 225,000 people diagnosed annually who need ALCF's help and support. Danielle creates and manages all patient programs and services, including the Living Room Support Group speaker series, which you'll hear a little bit about later, uh, patient education handbook, mobile apps, and centers of excellence. She also does one-on-one -on -one consults with patients and families, helps with referrals, and getting second opinions, and a whole host of other um, hands-on hands -on, um, experience, and you won't believe that she does that having four children. Um, her professional experience includes owning a women's clothing store and working in dentistry for, as an RDA for 10 years. As I said, she has four children, ranging in age from teenagers to 30-somethings. And other than motherhood, Danielle says that she's never had a more rewarding, rewarding role in her life than the one she has at ALCF, and I absolutely love that. Um, David and Danielle will, talk, um, Danielle will talk about the progress in personalized medicine for lung cancer, disparities in personalized medicine delivery for lung cancer, some solutions and best practices they and others in the lung cancer community have developed in response to where, um, in response to the challenges, and where there are remaining gaps of knowledge. Um, that are standing in the way of providing lung cancer patients with optimal care. So we are going to get your slides up and we'll let you take it away. Great. Great. Who thank, would like thank, to thank you, Cynthia. Um, um, thank you, everybody online. Um, it's nice to, uh, uh, to be able to present a little bit about what we're doing here um, in, in the personalized medicine space. So happy, happy to be here. David and I are going to tag team this presentation. Um, we are trying to fill Bonnie's shoes <clears throat> in getting this done. She, unfortunately, at the last minute was unable to, uh, to do it herself. So she definitely sends her love and her hellos to everyone. So a little bit about who we are. Cynthia, thank you for, uh, for the introduction. Um, the David, I was like, wow. <laughs> I don't think I've actually heard anybody speak that out loud, and I'm very impressed, David. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but our goal at the foundation is to transform lung cancer to, into a chronically managed disease. Um, as you can see on this, on, um, oh, I have to learn how to advance the slides myself, right? There we go. Okay, hold on. There. Um, um, as you can see, we're, we're hoping to do this by increasing early detect detection, improving consistency and quality of care, increasing treatment options and effectiveness, and we're doing all of this by um, developing and providing patient support, uh, programming and education, as well as funding uh, novel and innovative research. Uh, next slide. Um, I don't need to go into what is personalized medicine and how it's transforming cancer care. Cynthia did a a great job of, of defining that. 
Um, but what I do want to talk about, spend a little bit of time, David and I talking about, is how personalized medicine specifically is transforming how lung cancer patients are being treated. Um, these are, um, as you guys can see in this box, some of the ways in which um, these things are happening with screening and early detection uh, fairly recently coming into play, at least for a certain subset of patients, uh, multidisciplinary teams and tumor boards, molecular testing, um, um, identifying targeted therapies, PD-1, PD-L1 um, for immunotherapy, as well as tumor mutation burden, combination therapies, clinical trials, supportive care, survivorship. Um, there really are no two patients alike. Um, like our fingerprints, our body prints are very unique to us, and that's a direct quote from Bonnie. She likes to use it um, um, as often as she can. Precision medicine is, is really personal medicine, um, as Cynthia s stated. It, it, it treats the entire person, looking at medical history, uh, proper upfront di diagnostics, including genomic profiling, um, correct corresponding treatments based on those findings. And then one of the most important things that's quite often forgot is this shared decision-making process where the physician or the, the clinical team is speaking with the patients and the caregivers about what, what are the goals of care to that patient. So um, these are just some of the things that, uh, that we are working on in, in, in that area. David, I don't know if you want to add anything to that before I move on. Yeah, thank you, Danielle. Um, just really quickly, I know that um, for our purposes today, we'll be focusing primarily on lung cancer and oncology. Uh, and that we understand uh, precision medicine crosses well beyond uh, kind of these areas and, and touches us in so many ways within the, the, the healthcare community. Um, I, I do think, though, that lung cancer is an interesting place to start and talk about in the fact that, you know, over the past basically decade, we've had 18 different uh, target therapies approved, as well as what's going on in the immunotherapy space and that need within uh, lung cancer and oncology to really talk about this idea of personalized or precision medicine has been uh, brought to the forefront, and lung cancer in some ways has become kind of a poster child, at least within oncology, of what is taking, taking place. And so while, again, we will focus primarily on lung cancer and the work we're doing, we're hoping the things that you hear about today will cross over into other areas. And certainly, we're both uh, ready, willing, and, and able to jump in and answer questions on other topics uh, outside of this uh, if needed as well. So thanks, Danielle. Sure. Thank, thank you, David. That was, um, that was helpful. Okay. We believe that educated and empowered patients live longer. Um, one of the um, one thing we did about a year ago was we advanced the slide. We worked with a group called ZS Associates out here in California um, to try to identify not necessarily the patients typically that that we see coming in, and I think this this is, stands true for um, most of the other lung cancer groups out there, as well as other oncology and disease-specific groups. The educated patients tend to be the ones that are reaching out, right, the ones that we're talking to. But it's such a small percentage of the population. Um, we turned to ZS Associates to help us to try to um, reach the unreachable, um, to identify what barriers um, were being presented out there and what gaps could we find and how could we fill them in order to get access and information to this set of the population. So it looked at, um, the research we did looked at four, tip, four different types of, of patients, those with financial sensitivities or, or burdens, um, older smokers um, where the stigma came heavily into play, males who tend to have a, I can handle this, I don't need information from anyone sort of attitude towards their health care, and then treating the, un, the untreatable. There's a high percentage, particularly in lung cancer, um, of patients who are not offered any treatment um, um, from the get-go still to today. So those were the, the types of patients that we were looking at when we, when we did this, uh, this research. Uh, one of the things that we found right up front to come out of this was that patients were not receptive to education or information until well into their treatment. So this we obviously identified as a huge gap because if we can't get to the patients at diagnosis to get them the information and the education that they need in order to make these informed decisions, how can we expect 
precision medicine um, and patients to be part of, of, of this process. So this was one of the things that we absolutely noticed up front. I'm going to talk through the next couple of slides really quick, and then I'm going to let David talk about how we intend to sort of fill this, this gap. Oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, next slide. I'm trying, you guys. I don't know why it's not advancing. Mm, there it goes. Um, so uh, some of the things that we found when we were talking about, um, found throughout this study was that at, at diagnosis, patients are too distressed to actually know where to go to information. We found that the primary place that they go is to their physicians. One of the things that we know, particularly in the oncology space, is that 80% of patients are diagnosed in the community setting, and we'll talk a little bit about one of the um, things we're doing to access the challenge in that setting where, you know, you're, you're dealing with general oncologists who, between, um, you know, blood and, and solid tumor cancers, they, they, they're expected to know everything there is to know about all 100 plus different types, right? And I think that we believe that that's really unreasonable and unfair expectation to put on these on these on these guys so how can we help um, them become educated where they need to be as well as the patients so some of the things that we heard uh, patients say during this time of of shock and distress was I don't know what I could have done to change things whatever people said I didn't hear it that was a financially sensitive patient. Um, I don't remember my first appointment with my oncologist. It was a day of being in a fog. My entire world was yanked out from under me. Uh, another patient said, I didn't get a second opinion. I didn't even discuss the treatment with my oncologist. He called me and told me to be at the hospital the next day, and I went and started treatment. So these are just some of the things that we're hearing from these patients, really, really walking into their treatment unaware of really what their diagnosis even really means, what it looks like, what their options are, whether or not they're receiving precision um, care. So we've, we've, we've identified um, um, uh, this, as I said, as a problem. And what we've done is we've gone out to multi-stakeholders um, uh, and initiated um, a, a program. And I'm going to let David talk a little bit about what we're currently calling prehabilitation. Yeah, thanks, Danielle. Just really quickly to take a, a quick step back, the reason we wanted to start with this idea of reaching the unreachable is, is there's a, a, certainly a need as we talk about patient-centered, right? And that's what PCORI is, right? It's patient-centered. To get patients to the point that they can be active participants in shared decision-making. And the question becomes, when do these patients actually become uh, available, ready for that conversation, and what steps can be taken to really drive them to become part of that shared decision making and making sure that in this ever evolving time of precision medicine and changes, they have an understanding of what that means. And so this whole study, we decided to go with kind of reaching the unreachable because the patients who are already coming to us and having those conversations are finding that information. But what about the other patients who are not? We know within the lung cancer space, maybe 10% of patients are being connected with advocacy organizations or support groups that can really provide this education. But what about those other folks? Where are they getting this information and when? And so this study was really great for allowing us to have a better understanding of when are the patients going to be receptive, what type of information are they looking for, and what sources of information uh, are going to be considered the most trusted. And you can see on there where it talks about the medical staff really being the group that they're trusting and turning to. And I can tell you from an own, my own recent experience that there's this big gap of what patients are being shared and what's being told to them and when it's being told and whether or not it's being a, um, a disservice to these patients and not allowing it to really be a patient-centered approach and allowing them to be shared decision-making. So my brother had recently been diagnosed just in November with stage 3B kidney cancer. He was told he was going to have surgery for that cancer, which was good enough that it was caught early that he could. Um, after the surgery, though, it turned out that there were four uh, spots that were found in other places in his body that they were thinking was metastases. Now, this would have been a great opportunity to really explain what those next steps would look like, 
But in my brother's case, they said, well, we're just going to run some tests. You go home and we'll call you back when we get those results. And so uh, fortunately, my brother had me as a resource and I was able to really talk through why they sent him home, what these tests were, what they were looking for. But you can imagine for the average patient who's, who's waiting for these test results and trying to figure out what's going on, this can be a very uh, stressful time in a stressful situation. Now, the reason I bring all that up is because when we talk about precision medicine, there's going to be a greater need for upfront diagnosis, which means there may be this delayed time from when you're initially diagnosed or have that first conversation to when the doctor is going to start talking about treatment. And so that leads right into this kind of prehabilitation idea of can we use this window of time between diagnosis and treatment when people are normally getting this information to start this pre-education process for these patients and giving them more about precision medicine, why they're getting tested, what the test results may mean. You may be prescribed a targeted therapy or an immunotherapy. Here's even what those things are so that hopefully the patient when it comes time to treatment has a little bit better understanding and can really be part of that discussion and knowing what those decisions are because right now that's not taking place. So we thought it was important when we talk about patient-centered care, when we talk about um, really precision medicine and that education process for the patients to talk about this unreachable population and this need to really shift that window of when they're getting this information to earlier in the game. And, and then Danielle is going to touch on a lot of the programs that we do that help deliver on those things. But in this particular case, we have convened a, a group of folks across the spectrum, including patients, the Association of Oncology Nurse Navigators, uh, other lung cancer groups, the National Minority Quality Forum, Cancer Care, as well as the Patient Advocate Foundation. And we're actually going to create a program that will hopefully develop a curriculum that can be provided to these patients to help them get up to speed on all the things that they may face across the, the diagnosis and then treatment pathway as well into survivorship. And so, again, we wanted to start here just to set a framework of when patients are looking for this information, when they need it, and how that ties so importantly into patient-centered care, precision medicine, and shared decision-making. So we hope that makes sense, and we'll be sharing more of this program as it gets developed and goes forward. Um, but it really is going to be necessary for us to, to think about that window of time and use it in a, a, a more um, comprehensive fashion for these patients. And uh, I'm going to pause really quickly. Cynthia, for a point of order, I do see there's some questions which are coming up which are great. Are we going to save those questions maybe to the end, or do you want us to try and address them as we're, we're talking? Um, it's, we were going to have a little period at the end of your presentations for it, but if you think it fits well with what you're talking about already, you can feel free to answer it. Okay, that's great. Um, so I'm going to let us keep going and we'll come back to those questions, but we do see both of them from you, Sean, so we'll, we'll make sure we get them. But Danielle, if you want to talk now about some of the things we're already doing in this space around precision medicine and educating these patients, that would be great. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, with our handbook, our patient education handbook, Navigating Lung Cancer with 360 Degrees of Hope. Um, the handbook um, is sort of came to fruition um, several years ago. I was at a World Lung Conference in Amsterdam, and I was running around trying to find good quality education pieces to bring back to the patients that I was working with um, to try to, you know, provide them with a, with a source of education that was meaningful. And what I came to find really quickly in my search was that there was nothing that was comprehensive. And quite often the things that I was picking up were out of date. So the handbook um, is its first ever in lung cancer, comprehensive, centralized, up-to-date patient resource that's devoted to, um, to lung cancer and vetted by experts in the field. It provides um, detailed information in layman's terms, which I think is a really important note. Um, a uh, we did some market research as well in, in the United States. Um, the, the literacy um, grade level is about eighth grade. And when patients are online, uh, we know that's the second place that they go to try to, to find information outside of their, of their medical team. Um, they're, they're typically pulling up um, um, studies and reports uh, from physicians and researchers, and they just do not understand them. So layman's terms, easy to read format. The handbook is the culmination really of years of research, um, as well as conversations with experts and patients, um, which has resulted in this um, compilation of information found uh, in numerous print and, and internet resources. 
one of the things I think is really important to note based on um, the challenges of, of publications and things becoming out of date is that we opted to um, create this in digital format so um, that in this fast paced day of discovery, particularly um, around personalized medicine based on genomic profiling in lung cancer, we're able in real time to upload new and current information as it becomes available so that the very ne the next book that goes out um, is current and relevant to the person getting it. So we, we, uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, we, of course, have current up-to-date handbooks here in our offices to send to patients. We provide them for nurse navigators and, and community centers in particular, uh, but not limited to um, around the country. We were published, uh, or we had an abstract, there we go, um, last year um, at World Lung, uh, looking at this health literacy void for patients. Um, you know, we know that lung cancer is, you know, diagnosis is devastating and patients are often in shock and looking for trusted resources. So we really feel like we've provided this. Um, in this abstract, 26 patients were interviewed um, by a market research firm. Uh, patients did not have prior knowledge of ALCF, uh, the Bind Jade Area Lung Cancer Fa Foundation, or any of our support uh, services or resources. Um, so it was a, a, a blind group. Um, and the outcomes, basically what the patients were saying was that it was a one-stop shop, everything they needed to know about lung cancer in one place. Um, it delivered information in a straightforward way, mapping treatment options and next steps. And they felt that it would be most valuable at time of diagnosis. Uh, nurse navigators also uh, were given the handbook, uh, in particular from our Center of Excellence, uh, Community Hospital Center of Excellence, which we'll talk about in a second. They took an online survey, survey and 83% of the navigators said that they rely on the handbook at time of diagnosis in order to help educate the patient. So some of the conclusions that come out of it were that the, the, the handbook is really a valuable tool for patients and nurses, especially at time of diagnosis which helps to fill that void that we were talking about um, um, just a little bit ago. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is our patient uh, support group. So we call it the Lung Cancer Living Room. It is a uh, once a month, each month, uh, the third Tuesday of every month. It's a two-hour meeting held uh, live in person here in our offices in San Carlos, California. But it's also uh, live streamed, so anyone from around the world can sign in um, uh, watch the, 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 the program as well as uh, ask questions of the speaker. We invite key opinion leaders to come in and talk about different aspects of the disease and really provide a space for patients to have access to these opinion leaders that they otherwise wouldn't have access to regardless of where, of where they are in the, in the world. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the, 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 the purpose of this meeting is to educate and empower these patients and to learn from expert guest speakers, but it's also to get support from one another. Uh, like I said, it's a two-hour meeting that usually opens with an around-the-room patients, you know, introducing themselves, talking about who they are, uh, as well as um, um, being able to point out anything in particular that they want to discuss. It's one of my um, one of my my favorite, excuse me, programs that that we have here at the foundation. Here's just an example um, of this year's uh, calendar. Uh, so we have 12 in-house here in uh, California, but then we have a regional series as well where we've taken it on the road. So we go to different hospitals around the country so that those folks that are signing in typically uh, from the live stream can actually experience it one-on-one uh, -on -one, live and in person. So you can see by looking at this, it looks kind of blurry on the, um, on the, uh, here. Let me see if I can pull it up and read it. So this year we were in Columbus, Ohio, Memphis, Tennessee, Chicago, Illinois, twice, um, Hollywood, Florida, Denver, Colorado, uh, and then Los Angeles at the end of the year here. We really, really, really love this program. Patients really love this program. We uh, take it after the two-hour meeting and we edit it down into 25 to 30-minute high level, what you need to know most, and we house it in our patient education video archive uh, where it's also subtitled into Spanish and Chinese. So uh, in that library, we've reached um, a million views in 144 different countries. So there's a huge need out there um, uh, for, for patient access to this type of information. Uh, patient navigation. So 
uh, patient navigation here, there are three of us that mainly manage um, uh, these patients, Kim Perham, uh, who's an RN, Michelle Zay, uh, and myself. We offer personal guidance, one-on-one -on -one support, offered for free of charge to patients and their caregivers. Um, we really believe that we can help uh, the care teams, particularly again in the community cent centers where they're, um, where they're seeing all different types of patients to educate these patients, answer some basic questions, help them with questions to come back to their physicians with so as, um, um, as not to you know, have too many follow-up calls and, and that sort of thing. Um, we are, uh, we've, it says hundreds of patients here. We've literally over the last 12 years worked with thousands of patients. Uh, providing that type of support. So, so Danielle, I'm going to jump in really quick because there's a couple of great questions that I think have come in while you, while you've been chatting, and then we'll yeah. get back into it yeah. um, that I think are really important. Uh, Eric had asked the question: um, Any outreach training education aimed at care providers and or family members? Uh, the truth of the matter is, most of our materials, most of our um, um, most of our our educational programs really are used by not just the patients themselves, but the caregivers. So Dan Danielle was talking about our living room program. The truth of the matter is, is we have just as many caregivers come to the room as we do patients. And I'd say half the people who are online tend to be caregivers who are asking questions. Um, in the lung cancer space, the average age of our patient population is still uh, relatively high. It's about 65 to 67 years old. And so in many cases, it's the adult children of those patients who are coming to us information and they readily and actively participate in our living room or are the ones ordering the materials or having those conversations even with our nurse navigation services. We don't have anything that's maybe directed towards them in terms of, you know, a guide to caregivers. Um, but but we do have um, great use across all of our different platforms by caregivers. In terms of, I see a note from the MMRF and Marcus, uh, how many patients on average, um, it, it really varies greatly. Uh, I can tell you for our living room itself, uh, usually live, we have anywhere between 70 and 100 people watching on YouTube as well as another 70 to 100 watching uh, on um, Facebook because we do both platforms. On Facebook, we're able to track, and usually there's about 5,000 impressions in total within the first uh, two days of it being on there, meaning people are coming back to those resources. And then traditionally, after we do our living rooms, we will see an uptick in the number of calls um, that are coming in uh, to us, and that can vary anywhere between um, a handful of new patients each week to, to uh, a couple dozen patients each week who are reaching out to us for one-on-one -on -one navigation services. And then finally, with our handbook, we, we distribute somewhere probably around 10,000 um, copies a year through various channels and various means. Now, uh, those numbers may seem good or bad. I don't know anyone's perspective, but we can say we know we're not reaching enough. 220,000 uh, new cases of lung cancer diagnosed each year. And we would love it if we could get um, more more patients to engage with us, and we have some things we're trying to do uh, in that area. And then um, there was also a question from uh, David Kaiser about patient education um, and whether we support kind of the basic education of the public or, or should it be happening when the medication is prescribed. Um, you know, what we found is it can be really difficult to educate people before they know they have a need for something. And, and what I mean by that is there's been a lot of public campaigns around maybe clinical trials, there's been campaigns around awareness for screening and so on, uh, and even around different uh, maybe uh, drugs and things. Um, until a person's diagnosed, in many cases, they don't really pay attention to that type of information. And so we found just with our limited budget, our focus really needs to be at that time that people are diagnosed to start trying to provide that education. Uh, I have been on multiple uh, panels and conferences where they've talked about trying to do something on a more broad, broad public basis. But again, I, I think the return um, may be limited unless you're willing to spend kind of Walt Disney money on a big public campaign. Um, you know, we still have people who use tobacco products even after 40 years of hearing how horrible it is. So there's a limit as to what you can do from kind of broad public education. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but I really think when people are impacted with a diagnosis or a family member's diagnosis, that's when they start paying attention. We just need to try and get them in as close to that diagnosis as possible with the education for them to, to really be able to, to utilize it and benefit from it. So I hope that answers some of those questions and we can address John's questions again a little bit uh, later on. Danielle? Yeah, no, that was great. Um... 
Thank you, David. I want to, um, we're going to talk a little bit about our lung cancer registry next. Um, I'm going to kind of open it up um, to, to what it is, and then I'm going to let David talk about some of the research we're doing through it. So we opened up, um, we started a lung cancer registry about two and a half years ago now. Um, uh, with, the, it, it's, with the thought being, if we could get patient reported outcomes, get a baseline survey, um, start finding, you know, patterns in some of this information that these patients are reporting them, are reporting on, um, and, and really have it as an open sourced platform and invite researchers, um, clinicians, and others to come in and benefit from this information in order to drive research based on patient reported outcomes. Uh, that it that we would be benefiting the patient in a in a quick way. So so we started the registry. We have about a thousand patients in there so far. Um, it is a collaborative effort. We by no means think we are going to get to the end of this road on our own. So we are open to collaborations and partnerships, um, not only within the lung cancer space but across diseases where we where we can see benefit and be able to help one another. So. Um, we partnered with the American Lung Association, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, and then for the um, study that we're doing specific to immunotherapy with um, CITSIS, the Society for the Immun Immunotherapy of Cancer. So with that, I'm going to let David talk a little bit about the research and the registry um, from his perspective. Yeah, you know, one of the great things is when I, when I was reading through kind of the opening of this um, uh, webinar series and the talk about you know, shifting the emphasis from reaction to prevention, reducing trial and error, adverse reactions, uh, the additional uses, and increasing adherence, and so on. One of the, the best things that we can do um, as a community is really trying to figure out ways to gather information directly from the patients themselves related to these topics. And what we recognized is while in the lung cancer space there were great platforms that still exist, um, such as uh, Inspire, Patients Like Me, Health Unlocked, uh, Smarter Patients, that were capturing a lot related to maybe the psychosocial aspects. There weren't a lot of patient-reported uh, platforms out there where they're asking questions specifically about diagnosis through survivorship issues as well as trying to then do deeper dives into specific uh, areas related to real-world evidence uh, in care. And so the, the, the platform for, for the registry was launched as a way to start trying to get some of that information directly from the patients themselves. You know, we're one of the few fields when you talk about medicine where when you look at that direct customer feedback loop, it doesn't exist as it does in some other places. My wife is in the marketing firm and the marketing world, and they'll do focus groups on everything related to the color of the return slips uh, paper that they use for returns all the way up through product delivery. And yet in the healthcare world, we very rarely go back to the patients themselves to ask about satisfaction and care or other things. Um, you know, and, and again, part of it is that feedback loop and that the patient sometimes isn't the ultimate customer. I know that sounds strange, but when you think about it, the payers really are dealing with the medical professionals. The medical professionals are dealing with the payers. The researchers are trying to get things approved through the FDA, and the patients are really kind of the third avenue um, or the third party to a lot of those transactions. And so a registry where patients can provide that voice as to what's really happening was so important, and that's why we ended up launching this platform. What's great is we're collecting baseline information all the way up from initial diagnosis to what else were you treated for all the way through survivorship. And now what we're finding is that there's, really, there's these really interesting kind of questions that we can go back and ask and do a deeper dive. Immunotherapy is really this brand new thing in many ways where the only information related to patient reported outcomes that had been collected had been done during the clinical trials there was no real world evidence of what was going on with these patients. So in conjunction with Thomas Jefferson and Moffitt, we launched an immunotherapy patient reported outcome study that's going back to these patients who've now been using it in some cases over three years and saying, how has it actually changed your life related to side effects, uh, adherence to treatment? Did you have to discontinue these side effects? What were the most common side effects? And then it even goes into quality of life issues around depression, relationships with family and other things. 
Um, to answer the question again from Marcus, yeah, patients go directly to our registry, lungcancerregistry.org. Any patient or caregiver of a patient can go in there and, and register. Um, there, there is a place in there where we're collecting biomarker information, and we're getting all that data. And the other cool thing about it is, is open sourced, meaning researchers can come back and apply to get access to that de-identified data and start figuring out what's going on within this space. So the patients are an underlies uh, resource when we talk about precision medicine, and when we talk about patients at centered care, they should be the people we're asking these questions of first. And our registry was an attempt to kind of do that. Yeah, and I just want to add that um, uh, the biomarker data is taken, um, the information is taken at diagnosis, um, at progression and rebiopsy, re as well as whether or not it was tissue or liquid. Uh, so we do we do take some pretty detailed information when it comes to, bi to biomarker and, um, and treatment history up to six lines of therapy. And then Danielle, I want to be mindful. I know we're trying to keep this at an hour, so I'm going to be the timekeeper for us because both of us, I know, have so much we wanted to add, but I want to make sure there's time for the other Q&A as well. Oh, you're yep. so nice. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's only two slides left, so we can go through this fairly quickly. Um, our Center of Excellence, Community Hospital Center of Excellence program, um, you've heard me uh, talk about a, um, a couple of different times or bring up a couple of different times during this um, during this presentation. So <clears throat> given that, like I said earlier, 80% of patients are seen in this community type setting, um, we wanted to see how we might be able to help provide um, um, education and drive patients to centers who were providing um, standards of care as you would expect to see within an academic center. So um, uh, we came up with a series of, of um, uh, sort of What's the word I'm looking for, David? A series of uh, metrics. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, around what good was going to look like, or what we thought good looked like, based on uh, conversations that we had with key opinion leaders in the academic setting. So, beginning with screening and early detection, running through proper upfront diagnostics, including diagnostic tools, um, genomic profiling, treatments, survivorship, and support. Um, a series of metrics that we now um, have embedded into what we're calling our COE impact study, which is, as you can see here, a data tool that really assesses the lung cancer care continuum. Um, we do uh, this analysis once a year, it's aggregate process data, so we don't have to worry about um, any HIPAA violations or, or any, any you know, regulatory issues associated with HIPAA, um, and we do compare it to non-COE centers. Uh, the goals, as you can see here, are to get participation and engagement and really try to gather some meaningful insights and, and a shared learning opportunity between the centers. We have 30 centers um, around the country right now, uh, and one of the things we are getting ready to do is our first ever um, uh, Center of Excellence Summit, where we've got 100% participation from the centers around the country. Um, that are going to be joining us in Nashville the first week of December um, to go over COE impact study, and study analysis, uh, what's working, what's not working, and really create what, what I continue to call the shared learning opportunity. So what's working, you know, based on the data out of a center in Florida that might not be working um, as well out of a center in Washington, D.C.? What can they learn from one another? How can they implement, uh, you know, what is working into their centers? We presented at um, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer World Lung Conference um, last year, as well as the year before, and we were published in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology last year. Um, um, we, um, I'm going to stop there on this slide, and I'm going to go to some of the data coming out of the study. So some of the really interesting information um, that I thought was relevant in particular to precision or personalized medicine, uh, starting with screening. In early detection, uh, follow-up is more common in center of excellence than non-center of excellence. One of the big challenges in lung cancer, um, given that uh, sc the screening is so limited and um, suspicious nodules are more often benign than they are malignant, there's a real challenge um, um, in diagnosing even with, you know, screening as, as, as current standards fit. But 47 versus 27 percent follow-up is a huge, huge um, win for the COE centers. 
Uh, COEs utilize more next uh, generation sequencing or comprehensive genomic profiling and companion blood based biopsies than non COE, 79 versus 58%, which is huge in the area of precision medicine. Uh, liquid, as you can see, there are 74 to 18. Uh, COVs more commonly test for PD-1 or PD-L1 as it relates to immunotherapy, uh, immunotherapy, 79 versus 61. Increased numbers of palliative and supportive care discussions, 80 to 62 percent, which I think is goes back to um, the point we were making earlier about really treating the whole person um, and keeping them um, healthy across the board. Uh, and COVs are more likely to be set up to participate in clinical trials than non-COVs, 80 versus 47 percent. Um, clinical trial enro enrollment, uh, COE versus non-COE, 89% versus 70%. And the most common reason patients are not molecularly tested within the community hospital setting as we see it in our network um, is biopsy fail. So really, you know, looking at diagnostics um, in, in a personalized and precision sort of way is really, really important um, in ensuring proper upfront diagnostics in, in the lung cancer. Uh, patient. And I never should switch the deck here. There you go. David, do you want to add anything? I'm trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. It. You, you were just about to say, Danielle, that I think was right on the money. When we talk about precision medicine or we talk about personalized medicine, the truth of the matter is precision medicine is going to require um, personal and precision diagnosis and diagnostics. And so one of the big things we focus in with our Centers of Excellence program is just making sure that patients are getting screened. And, and I recently was at a conference that was hosted by Foundation Medicine, and they had some interesting information. This was for all metastatic patients across tumor types. And in their data, only about 20% of patients were receiving comprehensive genomic testing, or NGS, about 20% were receiving single marker testing. So that means 60% of patients who are metastatic cross pan tumor types with this area of precision and personalized medicine were not getting any type of a screening and that's an incredible disservice to those patients. Why do I say that? Because within Foundation's Medicines group that they have tested about 67,000 patients, 35% of them were actually matched to FDA approved drugs and 80% were actually matched to clinical trials. So again, if we're talking personalized medicine and precision care, we're talking patient centered, we need to be testing these patients and making sure that they're getting matched up to these approved therapies in these clinical trials. It's the only way we're going to see the advances that we want to see in these areas. A um, couple of great questions. Why was the testing limited? I think that's a multifactorial uh, problem. Um, it, it has to do with uh, physicians maybe not even knowing about uh, the testing. It means that so many are seen in community settings where they're treating for every type of cancer, and maybe they don't really have the time to understand. Uh, the related information related to uh, the testing and the need for testing, uh, patients not knowing about it, um, the complications that are seen around it. I think there's a whole host of issues of, of why the testing was limited. We just know we need to change it. Uh, and then, Sean, I know you had a question here about um, 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 participation in, in, the, in the research in the registry. Um, we, we don't necessarily have any specific initiatives ar around uh, that. Uh, it's just kind of part and parcel of our work. We haven't even touched on our sister foundation, the Adario Lung Cancer Medical Institute, where we actually uh, run IRB-approved studies and, and trials um, that does have a lot of that information. But I just know for time's sake, we're probably not going to be able to touch on on some of that. A uh, great question from Lisa about a, a confusion between germline and somatic testing. Uh, absolutely. We see confusion on that. Most people don't know what germline or somatic even mean. And one of the first questions we hear when people hear genetic profiling or genomic profiling is, does this mean my kids have it and they need to be tested as well? And so there's an education process that comes in with that as well. But I'm, I want Danielle and I to pause because I, I want uh, David and, and Cynthia to jump in here and make sure we stay on time and, and maybe help us address these in a more systematic uh, manner. Yeah, so I think um, it, a couple of the questions that uh, we thought was important for us to just address from a, a PMC perspective. Um, there are a few resources that we have on our website that are geared more toward um, general education of personalized medicine. So some of the ideas uh, that came up just through Q&A that are specific to all the efforts you have going on in lung cancer have gotten our wheels turning about how we can, um, you know, update those resources and maybe make that information more um, more 
consumer and, and patient facing. Um, we also don't have Walt Disney money, uh, so, but, but to the extent that we can do that um, both you know, on our own and, and working with some of our other uh, partners, I think that that um, was something that, that we can take away um, on our own and maybe build upon. Uh, there was um, a question that came up related to uh, building trust in research specific to, um, to your initiatives, and I think um, that's a question that we're hoping to address in the larger context, uh, both at our upcoming conference in Boston, but also working through some of our um, uh, patient advocacy organization partners who work with communities that historically um, have had more challenges related to, um, to, to trust in research, and so uh, perhaps that's something that, that we can help to build on as well. Um, and I think that uh, there may have been one or two other questions um, that, that we can address privately, but I think it, we went through the list and it seems like you, you did answer most of the questions as you were going through, so that's terrific. Um, and thank you so much for doing that. But um, if, if it's okay, uh, we'd like to move on to, um, to our prepared Q&A and then um, just you know, give a quick wrap up of how we're gonna use the information that we took from this webinar um, to, to build on for the rest of the project. But, but thank you, it sounds like you're all doing amazing work on behalf of your community and, um, and, and something that we hope to support with what we're doing with this project. But, um, Thank you for giving us the opportunity. And, and if people need to reach out, please do so. Um, Danielle and I are easy to find. Uh, you can visit www.lungcancer.org to get more information, or you can email us, uh, david at lungcancerfoundation.org or danielle at lungcancerfoundation.org, and we'd be happy to, to schedule time to maybe do a deeper dive on any questions for our part. But um, uh, thank you so much to, to Cynthia and David for including us, and, and we'll turn it over to you for the, the formal Q&A here. Terrific, thank you. Um, so we're gonna move on. We have about seven uh, prepared questions that we wanted to use um, as background to, to help us plan for our next webinar and start developing um, some principles that are going to, um, to underlie our research agenda. Uh, but just it, listening to, um, to David and Danielle talk about a lot of their programs, um, I think it's important to um, get some sort of baseline for where some of the other um, communities that are represented on the line are at. Um, we know we have a number of lung cancer groups, but there's also um, patients and patient advocates from the, um, the diabetes community, as well as the COPD um, foundation and COPD community, cystic fibrosis, uh, food allergy, Tourette's, uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so we were hoping um, just through the polling function, which um, you'll see a question pop up uh, to the lower, um, like right hand side of Bottom your screen. Right. <laughs> um, if you can just answer in your disease area um, whether or not you, you know that there's a personalized medicine or targeted treatment strategy. And just so you know, the results will be de identified, but we hope to um, walk through some of the, um, the results on the next webinar um, and also use it as the basis of our discussion. So this is helpful. Great, um, we're gonna close out that question. Um, and we'll move on to the second question. Um, you know, prior to diagnosis in your disease area, um, it sounds like in lung cancer, there's a, a bit of a challenge with uh, patients knowing um, what, what targeted treatments are available to them. Uh, but, you know, given that there are other patient communities and providers that are represented on the line, uh, prior to diagnosis, did you um, or the patients you represent or the patients you see, um, are they familiar with the targeted treatments and personalized medicine strategies um, prior to diagnosis? All right, I think we're gonna move on to the next question. So just thinking about um, how uh, folks become familiar with, um, with targeted treatment strategies prior to diagnosis, um, where do you find the most common resources to be? Um, sounded like in lung cancer, um, it wasn't until the point of diagnosis or someone um, you know, reaching out specifically that, that patient advocacy groups in that context uh, may not have been the primary source, but potentially one of the best sources. Um, how do you think that people are getting information or have gotten information? Okay. 
Okay. Um, so we'll move on to the fourth question. Um, are there challenges outside of lung cancer um, that you feel um, are, are people who access um, and accessing targeted treatments? Do you think that there are similar challenges to what you heard from Danielle and David in your own patient community? And that question will come up right now. Oh, you all are much better th with the technology than I am. <laughs> I am impressed. Great. Okay. And just given that there, um, it seems like there have been challenges identified, are you all familiar with any research or advocacy efforts in place to overcome the access challenges in your disease area that you're focused on? Let's see, yes or no. All right, and then we just have two more questions for you. Um, the next one is, um, what do you believe is the most important for your um, doctor or other healthcare provider to consider uh, when treating your disease area with a personalized medicine strategy? Um, is it your biology, values, or circumstances? We're asking that you pick one. Um, and just to clarify, we thought that it might be helpful to give a sense of what we're looking at in terms of uh, defining values. Um, we think of them along the lines of the patient's religious or spiritual values, social and cultural values, uh, values around quality of life, uh, personal priorities, and beliefs about health and personal responsibility. And then circumstances, um, this would incorporate some of the contextual um, issues that, that go into a person in, in approaching their disease, so things like emotional state, um, as Danielle mentioned, things like being in a fog. Um, at the time of, of receiving a diagnosis, uh, relationship with a healthcare provider, economic situation, social support, access to care, um, responsibilities as a caretaker, and cognitive abilities. So if you can pick one, that would be helpful. Okay. All right, and the last question, um, thinking of what you identified, oh, sorry. I'm, so there's a lag with the slides on my end. Um, the last question is um, just thinking of what you identified as the most important consideration. Um, what would be most helpful to you um, when we're um, approaching the research agenda? Um, if you can pick one, is it the ways of communicating additional information on biological differences that allow for informed decision making, identifying and communicating treatment options based on patient and caregiver values? and understanding patient and caregiver circumstances and presenting treatment options in ways that highlight how treatment aligns or doesn't align with those circumstances. Okay. And we're going to keep that open for another minute or two. Seems like people are responding to it, which is great. Okay, and we noticed that one of the polls actually timed out before uh, we recorded all the responses. So if you didn't feel like your uh, response was captured in question number six or seven, if you can just let us know um, through the Q&A or by email afterwards, we'll make sure that we account for it. Thanks for letting us know that. Okay. Um, so we're just going to pause for another minute or two, um, and um, I mentioned at the top of the call that uh, we did want to leave an opportunity for, um, for you all to just give us some uh, feedback on uh, any thoughts you had through the presentation or just generally as we kick off the project. 
So if you do want to um, make any comments now or um, let us know um, about anything we should consider moving forward into our next um, web form, we'd love to hear from you. So um, you just need to raise your hand by going to the participant button at the bottom of your screen on the left-hand side and then um, clicking in the upper right on the hand uh, to raise your hand. Okay. I don't think anyone has raised their hand. All right, no one's raised their hand. So um, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a quick wrap up um, and let you know what the next steps for the project are. Um, we're gonna take all the feedback that we've gotten from you and the responses to the polling question and uh, we're gonna hold our next web forum and the time frame for that is mid to late January of 2019. So we have a bit of time. Um, you're going to receive an evaluation survey for this webinar. Um, I think as we went through it, we picked up on some cues um, that will help us improve the next one. Um, so uh, but we'd encourage you to fill it out just to let us know um, if there's anything that we can do to improve it to make it more meaningful you, for you when we have our next webinar in January. Uh, we plan to post the webinar ar archive and the slides. Um, we know that some of the slides were a bit fuzzy, so um, we'll put up a, a higher resolution version of the slides on our website, and they're going to be available on our website, which is www.personalizedmedicinecoalition.org. Um, we're going to continue our outreach, so um, if there are individuals or organizations that you think will benefit from this program moving forward, please let us know. Um, we can, like I said, accommodate up until this point 100 uh, people participating on these forums, but if there is increased interest, we would love it, and um, we, can, we can increase that number. And if you have an idea, please stay in touch, and we really do mean that. Um, we want to, to learn from your experiences and ways that you're looking to learn more about uh, personalized medicine for your community and how the research, the research can best support it because we definitely are looking to move beyond um, just how personalized medicine is um, approaching cancer treatment. So this is our contact information and please feel free to contact me or David at any time. Um, some of the resources that I mentioned are available on our website, but you can also follow us on Twitter. Um, we have a lot of communications we put out and um, are going to be tweeting a bit about this project as well. So we, we would love for, for you to stay in touch. And um, I think we ran a bit over time, so thank you all for staying on. And we hope you have a great afternoon. And if you're celebrating, celebrating Halloween, happy Halloween to all of you. And we, we really hope that you'll join us again in January. Take care. <laughs>